Okay, the order of worship for today, you have. Uh, this is also going to be on the screen, starting with the song, The Advent of Our God. After the bells ring and kindly introduces, we'll stand to sing that hymn. name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In hope, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. O oh God, our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, you are the one who forgives our sin. Many sins overwhelm me, O oh God. In my sinful nature, I have rebelled against you in my desires, thoughts, words, and deeds. I truly deserve your righteous punishment, but my hope is in you, O God, our Savior. Hear my confession and do not turn back. I look to you and you alone for forgiveness and peace. God, our Savior, answers our need with awe-inspiring acts of righteousness. Christ Jesus came to take our place and act as our substitute. On the cross, he endured the wrath of God that we deserve to bear. Then on the third day, he conquered death for us. He sends the Spirit so that grace, mercy, and peace are ours from the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, I, a called and ordained servant of the word, in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. And in him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. You may be seated. Our 
God Creator King. Oh, happy town, oh, blessed land that keeps our gracious King's command. Bless the heart when He comes in. His holy reign there to begin. His entrance is the dawn of bliss. He gives us hope and makes us His. Our highest praise we bring. At the 1030 service, we have a baptism, so that's what's on page 3, 4, and 5 of your service folder. But for right now, we're going to skip to the children's message for today. So kids, you can come on up. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Lots of decorations go up at this time of the year, right? But most of those are Christmas decorations. We're not quite at the Christmas yet. We're still in the season of Advent. And really, as far as Advent is concerned, which is the time before Christmas, there's really only one decoration. There really aren't any other decorations. So what one are we talking about? That wreath. The Advent wreath, that wreath that very specifically has the four candles on the outside and then the big candle in the middle, okay? That's called the Advent wreath. We bring it out during Advent and each Sunday we light one more candle. So today was one candle, next week will be how many? Two candles, right? And then three and then four and then finally it's going to be Christmas. The way this started, as a matter of fact, 1839, 1839, there was a man in Germany and he operated a school, a school for kids your age. And it was in the middle of the city of Hamburg. And many of the children are very poor uh, and didn't have much at home or anything else like that. So they were always excited about Christmas. And every day they would come to school and they'd be asking the, the teacher, how many more days to Christmas? How many more days to Christmas? So he decided that he would help them learn how to count by also counting down the days to Christmas. So he made an advent wreath. And he took a wheel off of a cart, a great big wooden cart. He took the wheel off of it, and he drilled holes in that wheel all the way around. He drilled four big holes, and he put four big white candles in there for every Sunday. But then in between the candles, he, dr he drilled six small holes and put smaller candles in there. And he had red candles in there. And that was for the other days of the week. So this was like Sunday, and then he had a red candle for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then there was another big candle. So that every day of the week, they lit another candle. And that was one way that the kids were able to count. And they could count how many candles are not lit yet. That's how many days there are to Christmas. So that was kind of how the Advent wreath got started. It got started that way in the year 1839. And then other schools started to do the same thing. And then finally churches started to do the same thing. Churches started using Advent wreaths. But since churches only had services on Sunday, they didn't have churches on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they didn't put those small candles in. They just left the great big candles for the Sundays. And that's what's been handed down to us today. Okay? You guys might be interested to know that the Advent wreath did not really come to the United States until the 1930s. It's a really recent, really recent Christmas decoration, interestingly. But anyway, 1930s. Now, the man who made the wreath at first used white candles, just like we are using white candles. But I'll tell you, you can go to different churches, and they'll have different color candles, They'll have different color candles, okay? Some churches will have purple candles. You like purple, don't you? 
she's got a purple dress on and she perked up with, with purple here. <laughs> Other churches will have blue candles in them as well. If we had colored candles, we would probably be using blue because we're using blue, okay? But if we, if we had purple candles, I'd be wearing a purple thing, okay? Some of you remember the purple. Some of you remember blue, okay? And blue is obviously the common color today. Purple, purple was meant to be a sign of repentance. Like we remember of our sins and we look forward to the coming of Jesus who's gonna take away our sins. But blue is a color of hope, okay? It's a color of hope. And what has happened over the years is that the four candles of the Advent wreath have each come to stand for something different. And the four things that we usually talk about what they stand for are on the screen up there. You see the four words? The big one is hope. So today's candle is called the candle of hope. Next week, we light this candle, and that'll be the candle of peace. And then we light this candle, which is the candle of love, excuse me, joy, and then we light that candle, which is the candle of love. So we have hope, peace, joy, and love. So there's kind of different emphasis, emphases uh, during each of the weeks of Advent. So we start off today with the word hope. What does the word hope mean? Hope does not just mean a wish. That's how we many times use it, right? Maybe at Christmas, now it's going to be Christmas, and you're, you're thinking about a present that you would like, and maybe you're thinking, I hope I get a bicycle, or I hope I get an iPad, or something like that. And we use it to be like, I wish, okay? I wish for it to happen. It might not. It might not. I might not get the bicycle. I might not get the iPad. But we use the word hope that way. But that's not how we should think about it. Not when we're thinking about Jesus. When we're thinking about Jesus, it's very different. Hope means that we are sure that we're going to get it. When we hope in the Lord, we are confident that he is going to love us and he is going to give us exactly what he promised. For instance, he promises that when we believe in him, we will have forgiveness of our sins. So we say, I hope for forgiveness of sins. And that means I know I have it. Jesus promises that we're going to live forever with him in heaven. We can say, I hope I'll live with him in heaven. And that means, yes, I know I'm going to live with him in heaven. Because all these promises are promises of God. And can God ever break a promise? Never. If he has promised it, it's going to happen. Absolutely 100%. And so hope is based upon the promises of God. We got the blue like heaven. The sky, blue. We look up to our God. We look up to our God and we know, we know, we're certain that he loves us, that he's going to keep his promises and that we indeed are gonna live with him forever. So that's what we emphasize here on the first Sunday in Advent, hope. We're confident. God loves us very, very much, okay? All right, you guys can go back to your seats. And while they're going back to their seats, we're gonna get ready to say the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed emphasizes what we hope in. We hope in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And because he is true, he keeps his promises, everything that he, gar- that he says is going to happen truly will, including the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection, the life everlasting, as we say in the Apostles' Creed as well. Let's stand as we say that confession together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We'll sing the next hymn, Come, O Precious Ransom, Come.
And we read responsively verses from Psalm 43. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Then will I go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the heart, O God, my Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We're going to do the scripture readings and sermon differently uh, for these first three weeks of Advent. Uh, We're not even going to have three different scripture readings like we normally do. Instead, we're going to focus on one reading. It's going to be a little lengthier, and it's going to uh, be read within the context of the message. So I'm going to do, instead of calling a sermon, call it a scripture study. Uh, We're going to do that for three weeks. And the theme for these three weeks that we're going to do that is, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. We're going to take that mountain aspect there. And what I want to do is look at three mountain experiences from the Old Testament at which, on these mountains, God, very specifically, was telling us about what he was going to do in the future when Jesus came into this world. By looking at what God prophesied about the coming of the Christ, we also learn then very specifically about the Christ, and we understand him even more. So we're going to look at three mountaintop kinds of things uh, these, these weeks with the emphasis, go tell it on the mountain, that God is telling on the mountain something very specific that we should know uh, about this Jesus who is our Savior. And the first mountain uh, that we're going to be looking at is Mount Ararat. <clears throat> Mount Ararat comes in the context of the account of Noah. So I probably can safe to say that you probably never heard Noah very much during the season of Advent. Well, that's going to change today uh, because I think there's kind of something cool here that we can use for our Advent celebrations. You're going to have to use your Bibles these three weeks because it's not printed in your service folder. Take out your Bible, open up to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 will be on page 9 of those Bibles. <clears throat> Feel free to bring your own Bible if you want one of these weeks because we're going to be using them, okay? Now, the entire account of Noah is chapters 6 through 9. I don't have time to read all those, so I'm going to be just skipping around and looking at some of the verses, calling your attention to them uh, and highlighting some things that go along with our theme and maybe skipping other things that you might want to know about, but I just don't have time today, okay? So in chapter 6, Genesis, start at verse 9. Start at verse 9, the right-hand column. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Don't skip over the idea where it says Noah was a righteous man. And understand that whole context of a righteous man correctly. Whenever the scripture talks about righteousness, it is not, 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 ever the righteousness that is inherent in any individual because of what they do. Noah is not righteous because he did good things. Noah was a sinner just as anyone else was. In fact, there's going to be a story in the Bible about how after he got off the ark and there was some time later, he is ending up drunk and naked laying in his tent, okay? There were sin- this is a sinful man just like everyone else. So how can the Bible say that he was righteous in the same way that God calls you righteous? He, by his grace, forgave Noah through Noah's faith. Righteousness is always a gift from God, a very specific gift of trust. When you trust in God, your sins are forgiven. Trust that Jesus Christ paid the price. Your sins are forgiven and the righteousness of Christ, like that white robe, is placed upon you. That's how Noah was a righteous man. It's the very same way that you are righteous people in the sight of God. 
okay? Don't put Noah up there. Oh, sometimes, it just drives me nuts. Sometimes people say, well, in the Old Testament, before Jesus came, people were saved by what they did. No, no one can ever be saved by what they did. In the Old Testament, they trusted God to bring a savior into the world. We in the New Testament look at, we trust God who brought a savior into the world. It's always focused upon the savior. Always, always, always. That's how it can say that Noah was a righteous man. Anyone who believes is righteous in the sight of God. Okay? So that already is getting at the whole idea of go tell it on the mountain. How come all this is going to be happening? It's going to be by the grace of God. Okay, moving on. Now the earth was corrupt. Here we go at the exact opposite. Look at the exact opposite. You've got Noah, the righteous man, but now you've got the earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So you have Noah, the righteous man, and then you've got evil people. But understand this. This isn't a, man, a time for us to be thinking, well, how does our world today, the world, the society in which we live, how does that compare with the society in which Noah lived? How bad was it back then that God was willing to destroy it by a flood? How does that compare to us? Were they a whole lot worse than we are today? That's the wrong comparison. We're not going to do any good by trying to compare our life today with people uh, back then or people at any other time. The comparison is always this. How does it compare to God's law? How does it compare to God's law? God says very specifically, do this. You shall not, you shall. That is the standard. By that standard, society back in Noah's day had fallen completely short. <laughs> and was worthy of judgment. Can I say the same thing about today? Absolutely. Can you say the same thing about any day and age? Absolutely. The point being that everyone needs to be concerned about the judgment of God, not because we're worse today than we were 20 years ago or 50 years ago, or we're better today than we were like back in Noah's day. That is an irrelevant comparison. The comparison matters with what does God's law say in all of its fullness. And then clearly, every society is condemned. That's always this thing here. Now we got Noah the righteous man, we got the evil society. It's always, God is a God of justice and judgment and a God of salvation. All societies stand condemned, but individuals can be saved out of it by the grace of a loving God. You know what's going to happen with Noah? Going to build the ark. This is how you're going to be saved. You know how it happens with you. You've been saved by faith in Jesus Christ. See, that's how come there's a connection between the story of Noah and the, and, and the coming of Savior. Go tell it on the mountain. This, what God did for Noah was to rescue him. Rescue him out of an evil world, an evil world that was condemned. It points to Christ. God does this. He rescues us out of an evil world, a world that's going to be condemned. Not by a flood, but by the destruction that'll come on the last day when the trumpet sounds. See the comparisons? Okay, let's look a little bit more. After this, you get all of the instructions on how to build an ark. Because he's going to say, go ahead and build this ark. I'm not going to read any of that. It's going to be about uh, saving animals as well. Um, that's not my major point here for today. Um, but if you really want to understand the major point here right at the moment with these ark, with this ark, with the dimensions of the ark and everything else like that, the best way to understand it is to take a trip to the ark encounter in Kentucky uh, and go walk on the full size uh, replica of the ark. And you will get what God was trying to say by this ark. When you go on that ark, it's huge. 
It's not as big as an aircraft carrier. No, it, it's not. Aircraft carriers are huger, okay? For that day of Noah's, it was the biggest thing ever constructed. And what was the point? When you go to the Ark Encounter and they, they explain things as how the animals, you know, people always wondering, how can all those animals fit? Well, once you understand that it's two kinds of animals, not two of every species, but two animals of every kind. You only need two dogs. You don't need a variety. You don't need all the different variety of, of dogs that there are. You only need two cats. You don't need all the different varieties. You take two cats, that's it. There's plenty of room on that ark. There's plenty of room on that ark for the animals. And you don't take the biggest ones either. Why would you take the biggest ones? Take the little ones. Take the ones that are youngsters, the ones that still have a lot of growing to do. People gotta stop being so stupid. to think you got, how can you fit all those big animals on the ark? Oh, how dumb. But anyway, there's plenty of room on that ark for those animals. And not only that, here's the major point, right? There's plenty of room on that ark for Many, 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 many more people. That ark is not just built for eight people. Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. That ark is built for many, 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 many people. Throughout the time that Noah was building that ark, he was proclaiming to people, the flood is coming. Destruction is going to happen. The entire world is going to be destroyed. You are going to die. Come on the ark. Come on the ark. Be saved. And everyone knew it. Everyone at least who lived in with any kind of vicinity of that area. He's building that ark for almost 100 years. And he undoubtedly hired lots of people to do it as well. That's another thing people get so stupid about. How could, two, how could f- four men and their wives build an ark that big? Noah was incredibly wealthy. All he had to do was hire people. And I have no problem thinking that people were willing to work for money, no matter how stupid the project they thought it was. Okay, it, it works, it works. Anyway, Noah's out there the whole time. The ark itself is a visible statement of the destruction that is going to come and the salvation that is being offered. It's right there. Then, here's the interesting thing too. Noah finishes building the ark. It's many, many years, obviously. And then, let's see, where do I want to go? Go to chapter 7, verse 6. Chapter 7, verse 6, page 10. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came on the earth, and Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and of all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark, as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the flood waters came on the earth. Can you imagine what that scene was like? When you've got all these animals simply walking up a plank and going into a door peacefully and going and to the places, the pens and the, and the cages that Noah has prepared in the ark. This went on for seven days. Noah wasn't out trapping these animals, right? They walked in on their own by God's miraculous power. And the people around were seeing this. Seeing this. Seeing the baby elephants walk onto the ark. See the the crocodiles crawl onto the ark. See the the lions walk onto the ark. See the birds flying into the ark. That never, ever happens. And this goes on for seven days. This is their last call. This is their last call. And you can be sure that Noah was there standing saying, come on, come on, come on. It's going to happen now. And instead, in their blindness... In their blindness, they said no. And then God shut the door. Right? Then the rain came. And they all died. Verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth. And the floodgates of the heavens were open. (coughs) Excuse me. Water came up from the ground. As the, the plates of the earth separated, water came up, water came down. 
The rain fell on earth 40 days and 40 nights. Go to chapter 7, verse 24, and then into chapter 8. We're on the top of the right-hand column, page 11. The waters then flooded the earth for 150 days. So 40 days, the water is still rising and the rain is still falling. But then after 40 days, the rain stops. But then the water is still over the mountaintops, over the mountaintops, over all the entire world. You can't possibly have a local flood that goes over the mountaintops. That is just dumb. It's over the entire world. All that death, all that destruction, all that judgment. But, verse 8, chapter 8, but God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded, going now into this new world. This new world. This will look so very, very different than what it was before. Mountains and, and valleys and deep oceans. Very, very different. Different topography all completely. Verse 2, now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heaven have been closed and the rain stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the water had gone down and on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. <coughs> so picture the ark, <coughs> as big as it is, resting at the top of a mountain range, Okay. And obviously it's not, don't just think there's a great big peak and it's balancing some way. No, it is gently set down, gently set down, having survived, having survived the wrath of God, having survived, having been rescued from it all, now gently placed back on the earth, the place where it was destined to be so that Noah and his family and the animals and so on can get off and live in peace. <clears throat> on the mountains of Ararat, the waters continued to recede until the 10th month, and on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. And then more days, there's, it's, it takes more time. The, then Noah's going to send out the raven. He's going to send out the dove and everything else like that. And then finally, go to chapter 8, verse 15. Verse 15. You, gotta, you can read the rest of it at home on your own time. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds and the animals and the creatures that move along the ground so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number upon it. That wording is very similar to how the wording that was in Genesis chapter 1 when God created and he told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. It's like a new world. It's like a new world. It's still under the wrath of sin. You know, still under the curse of sin, I should say. And things aren't going to be perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But this is a new start. A new start, okay? And this is on the mountain of Ararat, okay? Now, what happened on that mountain? This becomes significant, particularly for our theme, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. There's something specific that happens at this place that points ahead to Jesus. Not that everything so far hasn't pointed ahead to Jesus. It all has. It all has. Evil world, rescue, God's grace, condemnation. It all is going to be pointing ahead to Christ. And here comes the specific connection. Verse 20, chapter 8. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. It's hard to make a bigger connection to Jesus than a sacrifice. All the sacrifices of the Old Testament pointed ahead to Christ. Yes, he's going to be born in Bethlehem, and that's absolutely significant. The God-man Jesus Christ coming into this world. But we always remember why he came into this world. To die. To take away our guilt. To rescue us. To save us from the evil world. And here Noah built an altar and offered sacrifices. It's all about Christ. And by the way, don't worry about him sacrificing some animals that have now become extinct. <sighs> Got to remember that when it said take pairs of animals on the altar, excuse me, on the ark, you took two of every kind, but you took seven pairs of clean animals. 
Seven pairs, I didn't read that. Seven pairs of clean animals. Clean animals were the ones that were used for sacrifice as well as could be eaten. So this became food for them and there was an abundance. So that's what this was about. But the, but the symbol of the sacrifice pointed to Christ. But then there's a little bit more, as you well know. Verse 21, the Lord smelled in a pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from his childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. So there is a commitment by God, a covenant by God to say, I'll never do this again. I'll never destroy the world with a flood. Okay? He makes that commitment. But he's introducing the entire concept of covenant. Covenant, where God binds himself to do for his people what is for best for them. The covenant, when we use that word, we use it also in the New Testament. When we talk about Jesus Christ, we talk about the new covenant. The new covenant in his blood. The covenant that says there's something greater than this old covenant. This old covenant where I'll never destroy anyone with a flood. Here's another thing. For the sake of Jesus Christ, I'll never destroy people in hell. For those who believe, for those who receive the covenant, for those who take it by grace, like Noah did. I've got a plan, a plan of rescue, a plan of salvation. God, of course, put a rainbow in the sky to talk about this covenant. We don't use the rainbow so much to point to Christ. We use a cross. We use an altar. We use symbols like light and an advent wreath and a Christmas tree. All these things symbolizing for us the covenant that God has made with us, the covenant of Jesus Christ. Mount Ararat began to point to that. It's going to be fulfilled, of course, on Mount Calvary. When Jesus gives up his life, when he becomes the sacrifice, to rescue all people, to rescue all who believe in him for everlasting salvation. We talk about an ark. Just one last point. We talk about an ark. <clears throat> there is a church term that relates to this whole thing about an ark that you are sitting in right at the moment. The part of the church building that you are sitting in at the moment is called the nave. From the word nave is related the word naval, and I don't mean belly button, I'm talking about ships. The navy. Ships. For a long time, the church was regarded like an ark. A ship into which people come in order to be saved. Not from a flood, but to be saved from the greatest of all disasters, which will be the condemnation of Judgment Day, and the reality of hell come that last day for all who do not believe. But for those who come into the nave, for those who come into the church, for those who come into the ark, for those who come into the grace of God, there is truly everlasting salvation. That's how significant this birth of Jesus is, obviously. Because of him, we have the hope, the confidence of forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Each week we're going to sing a few verses of Go Tell It on the Mountain as our theme hymn for the season. Please stand as we sing Go Tell It on the Mountain.
and you may be seated. The offer will be received. If you've not yet signed the friendship registers, we'd appreciate it if you would do that. Welcome to our guests who are here today. Thank you very much for joining us. In our prayers this morning, we're going to say a prayer for the family and friends of Ken Tuttle. Uh, that is Lou Ann Betcher's father. Uh, he was called to his heavenly home on Thursday of this week uh, at the age of 94. Uh, his funeral is going to be tomorrow uh, at the Grace, excuse me, at the Crane Community Chapel in Austin. We want to pray for today for Lou Ann and Gary, for Jackie and Paul, and for all who mourn Ken's passing. We also say a prayer for Sue Smith's uncle, Ron Scari. Uh, he is hospitalized in New York with a very advanced case of cancer, and they also truly expect that he is kind of close to his death uh, at this time, too. We're going to say a prayer of blessing for Laura Lai Ann Clocky. Uh, she will be baptized at the 1030 service. She's the daughter of Brandon and Janessa Clocky, Janessa Ducks. Uh, for those of you that want to make that connection. And then we also say a prayer for Barb Erickson. Uh, Barb Erickson was released from the hospital, and she's now at the Stewartville Care Center uh, continuing to recover from that therapy. Would you please uh, stand for prayer? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, during this Advent season, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. In him and only in him do we have hope. Just like Noah trusted and was given hope for the future, so also we trust and you give us confidence, hope for the future. Confidence that our sins are forgiven by the sacrifice of Jesus there on Mount Calvary. Confident that you have broken the bonds of death and have given us life eternal through your resurrection and ascension. Confident that you are coming again at the last day when we will see you face to face and you will indeed receive us into the heavenly mansions that you have prepared for us. All of this is possible only because you came into this world at your birth. As we approach the Christmas celebration, we pray that you will use this Advent season, dear God, to strengthen our faith, to help us to reach out to others who are still in their darkness of sin and invite them to come to you, to come to your church, to come to your word, so that they also can be saved. Just like Noah proclaimed the message and invited people to come, so also we pray that you will bless us as we continue to share your message. And surely that many will hear it, that they'll be reconciled to you by grace and be saved for everlasting life. We thank you for that blessing that you gave to Ken Tuttle throughout his life, the gift of faith, the gift of hope, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of life. He is with you in that paradise that you are prepared for him. And now we pray that you'll comfort all who mourn his passing. That you'll comfort Luann and Gary, Jackie and Paul, and, and, all, and the entire family. That you'll comfort them with that peace that only you can give. 
the peace that comes from the knowledge that you, dear Jesus, have come into this world to bring life, life to those who don't even deserve it. And so that is our hope, that is our confidence, that is our grace. May it fill them today and always. In like manner, we pray also then for Sue Smith's family. We pray for her uncle Ron as he's hospitalized right now. We truly pray that this will be a time in which he can commend himself into your care and keeping and simply rest secure in your loving and powerful arms. And that you also bless the family with that hope that only you can give, the hope that comes from knowing Jesus. We thank you that today you're bringing Lorelai and Clocky into your kingdom, dear God. Here is a person who indeed is coming to be your child today in baptism. We pray that you'll keep her strong in her faith all of her days. And bless Brandon and Janessa very specifically that they can be your gift to her, your gift of sharing the good news of Jesus. We praise you for bringing Barb Erickson out of the hospital, and we pray that her time at the care center will be helpful as she continues to recover from her surgery. We pray for Dave Smith as he will have knee surgery on Tuesday. We truly pray that that be successful and that he be restored to good health very soon. We continue to pray for Larry Gilbert and Lyndon Luke, for Michelle Griffiths, for all the other people that we name in our hearts. Bless them all and help them always to live in hope and peace. In your name we pray. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He'll watch over your life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
and thank you for joining us. Let's go in Bible class in about 20 minutes. And don't forget Wednesday at 6.30. Go in peace and hope. <laughs>